From Tallahassee, Florida's capital city, North Florida Baptist Church presents the Family Bible Hour. Good morning. Oh, it's so nice to see you here today. Um, the first song that we're going to do together is called Soon and Very Soon, and I'm sure most of you all know it. It's a little bit different than you probably know it, but go ahead and sing out. If you want to do motions with us, that is A-OK, -okay, and go right ahead, okay? But I do want you to sing out. Can you do that? Yeah. Here we go. The next two songs we're going to sing are both songs we would like for you to sing with us, okay? And I'm sure that you may not all know this song, but I'm sure a lot of you do. So if you do know it, sing it out loud to encourage the ones around you. Here we go. Here is our King. 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 Here is our love, here is our God who's come to bring us back to Him. He is the one, He is Jesus. Here is our King, here is our love, here is our God who's come to bring us back to Him. He is the one, He is Jesus. Here is our King, here is our love, here is our 
the greatness of your mercy and love at the feet of Jesus and we cry holy 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 we cry holy 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 we cry holy holy mercy and love at the feet of Jesus and we cry holy 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 we cry holy 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 we cry holy holy Holy, holy, holy. 
Well, we're going to make a little bit of a move in our Truth, Love, and Worship series as we move into worship. I'd like for you to take your Bibles and turn to Isaiah chapter 6. We're going to look at verses 1 through 7 of Isaiah 6. The title of the message today is Call to Worship. Before I get there, I want to tell the praise team, you guys did really, really well. I will tell you this, that took a lot of work and you worked a long time. Thank you so much. <clears throat> you did a good job and uh, I really, really appreciate it. And you're going to have a great week. <clears throat> We've learned uh, so much about truth that God's Word is truth. And because uh, the reason that God's Word is truth is because God is truth. And as believers, we should be living the truth. Uh, we uh, believe the truth and we live the truth. The four uh, messages on love gave us the potential, I think, to change our lives. And we had four messages. From them, we established that we are, first of all, as believers, required to love. We have a requirement in our spiritual life, in our Christian life, that we are to love. And we find out that we were made to love. We were born to love, but we were born again uh, to come to understand that love and to have a love relationship with our brothers and sisters. I remember the Sunday that we rejoiced in the love of God and uh, the praise team sang that beautiful song, The Love of God, and did such a, a wonderful job and thrilled all of us. And then the last time that we, uh, the last message that we studied, we talked about uh, loving our enemies and uh, the challenge of loving our enemies. That was last Sunday, and I'm sure that all of you uh, left <coughs> the service and made things right with anybody who was your enemy, and I uh, hope that you did. So now uh, we have come through truth, love, and we're moving on to worship. The reason that we're bringing these messages is because I believe that this is, or it should be, the DNA of our church. This should be the, the makeup of our church, who we are, uh, how we are established, what we are known to be. Uh, so much is said about uh, worship today. Um, that which was once called the, the song service is now called the praise and worship time. Now, there are some of us who still call it the song service, but it has evolved to be known as the praise and worship time. A guy like uh, Larry uh, Martin over here used to be called, well, I can remember when they were called the song leader, and uh, then that moved into the minister of music, and now they are called the, the uh, praise and worship pastor or the worship uh, leader. And, uh, and there's nothing wrong with, with any of that. There's nothing wrong, and, and in many ways, I think it's a better description <clears throat> of what we're trying to do during the song service, and it acknowledges it uh, of more of what it should be, that we're trying to bring ourselves into a time of worship. However, we shouldn't shouldn't restrict our spirit of worship or attitude of worship or understanding of worship to that which happens inside of these walls on a Sunday morning. Tony Evans made this statement, if you limit worship to where you are, the minute you leave that place of worship, you will leave your attitude of worship behind like a crumpled up church bulletin. And that does happen a lot. Uh, a lot of times we will uh, leave behind what God did for us in the service and we, don't, we fail to, to take it with us. Another contemporary pastor had this to say, if there is one characteristic more than others that uh, contemporary public worship needs to recapture, it is the awe before the sur uh, surpassingly great, <clears throat> the unsurpassingly great and gracious God. And to that end, we are taking our text today. I think that any worship of God begins with an appreciation of God. If we do not have a, an appreciation of God, we cannot worship Him as we should. To me, there's no place in Scripture that gives us a better appreciation of Him than from Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah 6 and verse 1, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and the train of His robe filled the temple. Above Him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two He covered His face, with two He covered His feet and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. 
And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, uh, this has touched your lips, and your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. What a powerful passage of Scripture. That's one of those passages that the more you read it, the more you get out of it. It is a magnificent, one of my favorite passages of Scripture. Today, it is the perfect passage to introduce the idea of the importance of worship and how we get our hearts set and right for worship. The first thing that we must do is we have to come to the place to see Him as He is. Now, I'm going to return to the text several times. Let me return to it here where Isaiah saw the Lord. A couple of verses. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of His robe filled the temple. Above Him stood the seraphim, each had six wings, and with two He covered His face, and with two He covered His feet, and with two He flew. Now, the key to seeing this for what it is involves our understanding of the significance of the setting. That is, it takes place in the time when King Uzziah died. So the king of Judah is now dead. Uh, if you will, they're, they're leaderless. Uh, they they uh, do not have anyone uh, to turn to. Uh, they do not, uh, they're a church without a pastor. They're a country without a, uh, a president. They're a, a people without a, a leader. This is the, the time when Israel was uh, in a state of somewhat a, a state of, of turmoil because they had uh, lost their uh, leader. And without the king on the throne, they had to do one of two things. They had to either look around, and that would, of course, induce panic, or they needed to look to the Lord. Oftentimes, that's what happens in times of difficulty. We see the importance of looking to the Lord. We look away from uh, this, that which we normally would look, and we turn our eyes uh, toward the Lord. The, the Bible says to seek the Lord while He may be found, and it appears that Isaiah has found just the right window or experience or to experience something that changed his life. And a similar experience would change our lives. And in fact, his experience should change our lives. He saw the Lord, the Bible says, he saw him as he is. Now, how did he see the Lord? Let's just go through that very quickly. First of all, he saw the Lord seated on a throne. The first thing that, that God does is to take Isaiah Isaiah's eyes off of men and off the circumstances of men and put it on him. Now, let me just say a couple of things to you. We will grow discouraged and disheartened if we focus on those around us. We always will. Uh, it doesn't matter who's around you. <clears throat> you will at some point grow discouraged and disheartened if you focus on those around you. I'll say this. You'll grow discouraged and disheartened if you focus on yourself because you will find that there are some things that you cannot abide about yourself. There are things you cannot abide about other people. And regardless of the, the circumstances we're in, whether it's a church relationship, a business relationship, whether it's in our home, in our marriage, in our friendships, if we are not able to see the Lord, a time of discouragement will come to us because that discourages us. However, when we focus on God, that changes everything. It changes our understanding of each other. It changes our understanding of ourselves. It changes everything. One of the reasons that people halt at serving God and, and fail in the spiritual walk is that they fail to see the Lord. They fail to keep their eyes on Him. We remove our eyes from His sovereignty and we stumble over somebody's humanity. That happens all the time. Uh, you may stumble over my humanity. Uh, you may stumble over your own humanity. You may stumble over uh, your, your mate's humanity or a friend's humanity. And, and all of that happened because you took your eyes off of his sovereignty. Had you kept your eyes on his sovereignty, uh, you would have not stumbled over humanity. But that's what happens many, many times. People fail in that regard. The writer of Hebrews tells us, 
how that uh, many people are watching us, but we should keep our eyes on Him. Hebrews 12 and verse 1, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The first good sign for Isaiah is that he took his eyes off of the circumstances and put them on the Lord. That's the beginning of worship. If you came here today with a a set of circumstances weighing you down, if you came here today with a burden that really uh, has you in a, a difficult place, if you came today and your, your heart is, is uh, uh, focused on something else, maybe focused on your family, on your uh, job, or whatever it may be, if you can't get your eyes off of that while you're in the house of worship, it'll be hard to worship because the beginning of worship is to see God for who He is and thank God that Isaiah was able to see Him stand or seated, seated on the throne. That's key to the victory over our heartaches. It's key to the victory over our discouragement. It's key to the victory over our defeat. I'll tell you right now from a personal standpoint, there are many times when I can have a discouragement moment. I can have a discouragement week. I can have a discouragement period of time. But then there are those times when God will allow me to see Him as He is, so to speak, even in studying for a message like this, and I realize I've got to get my eyes off of what's around me. I've got to get my eyes off of me. And I've got to have the upward look that Isaiah was able to see, uh, to have. And that's what he did. He moved his eyes so that he could see the Lord. Now, when you see the Lord, here's what you're going to see. You're not only going to see him seated on the throne, you're going to see him high and lifted up. That is a wonderful thing. He's high and lifted up. This should be the objective of our worship, to see and acknowledge God high and lifted up. There's certainly an accessibility that we have with God, but in the familiarity, there must remain a sense of position and awe before Him. God is not so far from us that He's not available, but He's not so available that He is ordinary. Now, I think I ought to say that again because I think that's the kind of thing you ought to write down. God is not so far from us that He's not available, but He's not so available that He's ordinary. We serve an extraordinary God, not an ordinary God. As a practical matter, let me just uh, divert from our relationship with God for a moment and talk about our relationship to one another. As a practical matter, our place before God is a good reminder of our positions in life. This could be helpful to to everybody here, but particularly it can be helpful to young people, especially those of you who are uh, either teenagers or you're young in your career. Uh, You're you're kind of, you see yourself, if you will, uh, on your way up in life and career. There are goals ahead of you. I see that I want to be this or I I want to do uh, so and so. It's, it's possible to become so familiar with those in a, a position in your life or a, a, a place of position in your life. It's possible to become so familiar with them that you forget yourself. Now, by that I mean this. Let's say that, that you are several layers down from the CEO or from the, the chief person in, in whatever your business relationship or work relationship is. You're a few people down from that. Or maybe you're, uh, you answer directly to that one. I don't know. Here's, here's what can happen. You can become too familiar with that person so that that person fails to be special in your life. Now, I'm not saying that, that we shouldn't be close to God, and, and I'm talking on a practical basis right now. But here's what I can, I'm saying to you. It's entirely possible to become so familiar with someone in leadership in your life that you forget yourself. Here's what Proverbs says. The wise man said this, when you sit down to eat with a ruler, observe carefully what is before you and put a knife to your throat if you're given to appetite. Do not desire his delicacies for they are deceptive 
food. Here's what that's saying. That's simply saying this. In all of our relationships of life, don't forget yourself. Do not forget yourself. If you have a chance to be close to someone in authority or power or even notoriety, don't forget yourself. Uh, It could be a big mistake. It could be a big mistake if you forget that this person has this particular position in your life. Now, that's a practical application to uh, the spiritual truth that, that Isaiah understood. Isaiah saw the Lord for who he was. He saw him high and lifted up. Immediately, it gave him some perspective. It gave him perspective on who God is, and it gave him him perspective on who he is. He had seen the Lord high and lifted up. And why did he see him that way? Because God is royal and majestic. The fact that God's robe filled the temple and he was attended to by angels underscores his position as high and lifted up. Now, all of this uh, was putting Isaiah in a position of understanding his own place before the Lord. And that's the first step of worship. The first step of worship is to see God as he is so that we'll see ourselves as we are. That's the first step. It's a vital step. Here's the second thing. To hear, he he not only saw him as he is, but he heard his name proclaimed. There are many things that that we think about when we come to services on Sunday. You think about a lot of things, different things. You wonder what the sermon will be about today. Uh, You're interested to to hear the music and and what will the music be like and are they going to sing songs that I know today? And are there going to be some familiar songs today? Or are they going to sing some songs that I like today? You, you think about that. Quite honestly, uh, some of you, you did it today. Uh, you came to church uh, this morning with the eye on, I wonder what time we're going to get out. And <clears throat> people do that all the time. They, they come to church thinking about what time uh, that <clears throat> they're going to get out. All of those things are normal attitudes of the typical Christian. But our hope <clears throat> is to be more of what the believer, of what God wants the believer to be. Now, it's not hard for me to have the attitude and the understanding of a typical Christian. But <clears throat> that's not where I want to be in my life. I want to <clears throat> be more of what God wants me to be. I mean, I'd like to please you. I'd like to make you happy. But if in the course of making you happy, I, I fail to make God happy, well, it's a little bit like what profits a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul. What good is it to make you happy if God is, is not uh, happy uh, with me? And so what we want is to have a spirit and an attitude around uh, of, of understanding toward God that helps us to see Him for what He is and to hear Him for who He is. When we come to the house of God, we uh, should expect to come before His presence with thanksgiving and to enter into a a clearer, if not a deeper, appreciation for His holiness. All praise and worship begins with an appreciation for the holiness of God. This was the proclamation of the angels who stood around the throne of God. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. Now, if we're going to worship the Lord, if you want to worship the Lord, the first thing you have to do is to appreciate his holiness. You can't worship him if you don't appreciate his holiness. That's the first thing. There are a lot of people that talk about the various ingredients of worship and praise. But there's no worship and praise until we see him for who he is and we hear who he is and we understand that his holiness is a perfect holiness. It's not a pretend holiness. It's not a mostly holiness. You remember Princess Bride and, and when, when the, uh, uh, I think somebody, yeah, the, the prince died and they they took him to, to Billy Crystal, and 
Billy Crystal, who was this old troll or something, said, well, he's not completely dead. He's just mostly dead. Do you remember that? He's just mostly dead. God is not mostly holy. He is completely holy. He is perfect in his holiness. The angels proclaimed holiness three times. They said, holy, holy, holy. Some say that this is a referring to the Holy Trinity, but it's more likely speaking to the perfection of God's holiness. The threefold repetition speaks of the holiness being supreme or the holiness being complete. The Bible says that in God there is no variableness, there is no shadow of turning. He is absolutely, perfectly holy. Now there are those who believe that they can attain sinless perfection. There are individuals and religions that believe that they can attain sinless perfection. But i got to tell you this. I don't think that you can worship the Lord if you think you can attain sinless perfection. I believe that you always have to see yourself for who you are, that you are a, a sinner. I never want to see myself in such a light that it diminishes His holiness. I never want to think to myself, well, I mean, God can make a decision, but it's my life and I'm going to follow uh, the way that I want to, or I'm going to live it the way that I want to live it. I think that's a huge mistake. God is holy. We must respond to His holiness. And to see His holiness is to understand that it is perfect holiness. Now in a moment we're going to discover uh, the presence of God and, and how it humbled Isaiah and how it should humble you and me. But it should cause us to be humble. Isaiah heard the glory of God proclaimed in perfect holiness. You know what else? He experienced its permeating holiness. The angels continued by saying, the whole earth is filled with His glory. God is everywhere. The whole earth is full of His glory. One of the earliest theology lessons that I learned was that God was everywhere at all times. I learned that theology lesson uh, in Sunday school from a little song that I learned in Sunday school. Here's what that song said. Oh, be careful, little hands, what you do. Oh, be careful, little hands, what you do. For the Father up above is looking down in love. So be careful, little hands, what you do. And I learned to make my feet careful because the Father up above was looking down in love. And I learned to make my eyes careful because the Father up above is looking down in love. And I learned to make my thoughts careful because the Father up above is looking down in love. And I learned all of that in Sunday school. One of the greatest theology lessons for worship that I ever learned anywhere, I learned in Sunday school. And that is that God's holiness is permeating. It is absolutely everywhere. The psalmist said it this way in Psalm 139 in verse 7, where shall I go from your spirit or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take uh, the wings of morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. And the night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. Now the overriding truth here is that wherever God's presence is, God's perfect holiness is there also. Where is God's presence? God's presence is everywhere then where is God's holiness? God's holiness is everywhere. There is never a place that you can be that the presence or the perfection of God is not there already. And rather than live in fear of Him, seeing our actions and our attitudes in places where we don't want His perfection and holiness and presence to see us, would it not be better to live in awe of His holiness? I know that all of us enjoy the majesty of nature, and we see God in the majesty of nature. 
Would it not be a wonderful thing when we see God in the majesty of nature to not rejoice in His holiness and to not worship His perfection and His holiness? His holiness <clears throat> is permeating. It is everywhere. And we should, we should live in a state of worship as it relates to God. God is holy. His holiness is perfect. His holiness is permeating. Let me give you another thing. His holiness is powerful. He has powerful holiness. Verse 4 is worth seeing one more time. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. Many years ago, <clears throat> when our two oldest sons were, were little guys, I think Nathan was five, and he, he was uh, Bradford's age, actually. Uh, Nathan was five, and, and Matthew was, uh, uh, was three. We were in Germany, and we were in uh, Wiesbaden, Germany, and there was a, um, an Air Force base there. And the people that, that we were staying with had access to, um, to the runway. And so the, the guy who I think was, if I remember correctly, was the first sergeant of the base, the first sergeant took us to the runway. And he said, I want you to experience some touch and goes. And I think they put headsets on us, or we certainly covered our ears, and we made the boys cover their ears. And we stood, there was a fence there, but we stood at the edge of the runway, at the edge of the fence, and we could see the runway. It was probably as close as the very front of the church from here. And those, uh, I, I think they were F4s, I'm not sure. They were some kind of a, maybe a surveillance plane or a reconnaissance plane or something, but they were for real jets, and, and they were individual, you know, piloted jets, that kind of thing. And they were, they were doing that, that touch-and-go thing. And they came in, and you could see them coming. And, and they were pretty impressive as they, they came in. But when they touched, and they would touch right about where we were, and then they would pull up from there, they would go full throttle. And when they went full throttle, I'm telling you, you could feel the blast of heat on your face. You could feel the earth shake beneath you. You could, you could literally, your, your teeth chattered uh, because of the, the power of those uh, jets as they came through there. They just absolutely, and it was thrilling. It was so thrilling. And we stood there for really as long as we could because you couldn't take a lot of it. <clears throat> we stood there and, and watched those touch and goes, and they were just magnificent. Now, I say that to say this, when Isaiah experienced, <clears throat> what Isaiah experienced was that the very foundation of heaven quaked at the proclamation of God's holiness. Can you imagine that? I understand the earth moving beneath my feet a little bit at the touch and go, but I will tell you that the very foundation of heaven shook. This is an expectation for for every believer, that we will experience His perfect, permeating, powerful holiness, so much so that it shakes our very lives. If we could get even a glimpse of it in this life, we would be more likely to worship Him in humility and awe. It, it would change our lives if we could just have a, a bit of the understanding of the power of His holiness. If we could really see Him in His holiness, it would change us. We would be different. We would be a lot less petty. We would be a far less wanting to have it our way. We would be far less disapproving. In fact, we wouldn't even see ourselves in a position to approve or disapprove because we are, we are in awe of the thundering perfection of God. In fact, we would find it hard to even have an opinion because we are in awe of the thundering perfection of God. 
And rather than finding ourselves in the position of telling this person, this is the way you ought to do that, and this is the way you ought to serve God, and this is the way this ought to happen, this is the way that that ought to happen, we would be, we would be totally, I mean totally consumed with the reality that God is perfect and powerful and awesome and His holiness permeates the whole life. I'd better keep my mouth shut. That's just the way it is. You know, I can say stuff in front of other people. People say something, and I can say something back. But I, all I, I know to say when I come into the presence of God's holiness is, yes, God. I was sharing with someone the other day about a time. I've, I've had some particular times where I knew that I was in the holiness of God. I was standing in the presence of the holy God. And I remember two responses that I gave to the first time that I knew that I was standing in the, and there have been other times, but these, these are two times that, that changed my life. The first time I realized that I was standing in the presence of the Holy God and I really saw him high and lifted up for who he is and I, I saw the perfection and, and I saw the, the, his permeating holiness and his powerful holiness, the only thing that I could say was, yes, Lord. That's all that I could say. And that one yes, Lord, has changed my life completely. But it took me seeing him in his holiness and seeing him in his power and seeing him in his perfection and, and for him shaking the very foundations of my life. And I said, yes, Lord. The other time, all I could say was, I'm sorry, Lord. I said it over and over again with tears flowing down my face so bad that I could hardly drive the car. God had gotten in the car with me. And God spoke to me. Little child said, uh-oh, it was an uh-oh moment, I guarantee you. God spoke clearly and loudly to me. And there was no question that I was in the presence of His holiness. And it absolutely changed me. I want to tell you something, folks. When you come into the presence of God's holiness, here's what happens. You know your place before Him. You're put in your place before Him. Verse 5, Isaiah speaking now, I said, woe is me, for I am lost. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. I may love this verse more than any other of these verses. This is the most honest response to seeing the Lord for who He is, is that we see ourselves for who we are. It's a hard thing to see yourself for who you are. Oh, once in a while, I've talked about this before, you walk through a department store and catch a glimpse of yourself objectively in one of those three-way mirrors, you know, <laughs> and that gives you a little glimpse of who you are. But just for a moment, you kind of laugh about that. But I'll tell you this, when you see the Lord as He is and you get a glimpse of who you are, it changes everything. The angels were able to sing holy holy, holy. But Isaiah could only say one thing. I'm a man of unclean lips and everybody I know are people of unclean lips. I don't even know anyone who's able to cry out holy like you guys are crying out. I don't even know anyone who can speak the name of God with the same clarity and purity and holiness that you angels are speaking now. I don't even know anyone like that. I'm certainly not like that, not me, Isaiah said. I can't even say it. He saw himself. Jesus said that out of the abundance of our hearts, our mouth speaks, and his heart was absolutely filled with how unworthy he is. The whole point of this is to come to the place in our lives where we really see the Lord in his perfecting, permeating, and powerful holiness. 
He is God in every day of our lives, but He is not an everyday God. I'm thankful that I have access to Him every day, but I pray that I never treat Him as every day. He is the holy God. We must mark our praise with the words, handle with care. You young people, I love you and I, I love the, the move and the understanding and the desire for you to have praise and worship time and to praise the Lord and to sing songs to Him. But I want to say something to you. That's not best done with somebody, this person playing the guitar and that person playing the drums and so on. That's best done when you see the Lord high and lifted up. That's best done when you mark your praise, handle with care. Great God has gifted you and I've always said that but better than the gift that he's given you is the ability to see the Lord high and lifted up. And when you, when you give whatever he's given to you back to him with a sense of, Lord, I'm not even worthy to play this for you. And then you play that guitar. It's more praise to him than ever. We've got to mark our praise handle with, with care. We've got to make sure that we understand that while this is a powerful moment in our lives, it's a fragile moment in our lives, and we cannot and should not and must not inject anything of ourselves into our praise because He is the holy, perfect one. The worship of God is not to be trivialized, but realized from a grateful and an undeserving heart. And as we continue to examine the worship of God, we will no doubt explore how our worship might be manifest. But before any of us would judge how we will worship or how others uh, worship, we must appreciate the holiness. In fact, I will tell you this, when you and I come to a place of greater appreciation of the holiness of God, when we come to that place in our lives, we will be far less judgmental, perhaps not judgmental at all of how somebody else finds their worship of God. Because all we're seeing is how holy he is. I'm not so much interested in recruiting people to my way of worship as I am to revealing to myself how holy God is so that my way of worship will be fitting to him. You must know your place before him. And by the way, what is your place before him? What is your place before a holy God? That's the very last point today, and that is that we receive His grace and mercy. The beauty of God is that while His holiness makes Him unattainable, His forgiveness makes a way for us. I will never be able to reach to His holiness. I'll never be able to touch the hem of the garment of His holiness. But his mercy has made his holiness available to me. Isaiah knew his unworthiness. And, and with the simplest confession uh, found that he, he, he expressed how unclean he was. And when he did, he found the provision of God for anyone who is unclean. Verse 6 of our text, then one of the seraphim flew to me, Isaiah said having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth. Now this is the mouth of the man who said, I'm a man of unclean lips, and everybody I know are people of unclean lips. <clears throat> we cannot speak the name of God. We are not worthy to speak the name of God because we are people of unclean lips. And here's what he's saying that the seraphim took a burning coal that he had taken from the tongs, from the, with tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth, Isaiah said. And here's what the angel said. Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. <laughs> wow. Whew. Now, I'm going to tell you something. 
I've been Baptist all of my life. But that right there makes me want to have a Pentecostal running fit right there. I'll just tell you. <clears throat> my sins have been atoned for. God touched me. I was shackled by a heavy burden, neath a load of guilt and, and shame. Then the hand of Jesus touched me, and now I am no longer the same. Because he touched me. Oh, he touched me. And oh, the joy that filled my soul. Something happened, and now I know he touched me and made me whole. Isaiah said, I, I confess I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. And the seraphim came and he took the coals from the altar and he took the, the tongs and he touched my lips with the tongs and he said, you are clean, your sins are atoned for. It's like H.G. Spafford wrote, when he wrote these words, My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh, my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Why is it well? Because of my perfection? No. Because of my holiness? No. Because of his holiness and my confession. Isaiah said, I am a man of unclean. I'm with you, Isaiah. Me too. That makes two of us. Anybody else with us? We are people of an unclean lip. How do we know that? Because we see how holy God is. The beginning of worship is to know the Lord and live in humble gratitude of his grace and mercy. A.W. Tozier said, we are called to an everlasting preoccupation with God. God is worthy of our worship. One of the ways that you can reasonably be assured of your salvation is your desire to worship. Knowing the true God and recognizing idols that would take his rightful place are marks of a true Christian. Today is a call to worship. It is not our definition of or instructions in how to worship, but the call to worship, the call to see the Lord high and lifted up, to hear the perfection of His holiness and the sense of His power. It is, it is to transport beyond the hope that you could have uh, heard a good message today and, and desire above anything else to offer Him humble praise. It is today is our call to see God for who He is and to know God for who He is. When we give our invitation this morning, my invitation is for those who know God for who He is to come to this altar and kneel down and say, God, please let me see you for who you are, that I might begin to worship you that I might begin to appreciate you, that I might begin to understand who you are. And for those who may not know God for who he is, the invitation is to come and meet him just as you are. Meet him for who he is. You have been watching the Family Bible Hour, a ministry of North Florida Baptist Church in Tallahassee, Florida. If you would like a copy of today's message on CD or DVD, write to us at Family Bible Hour, 3000 North Meridian Road, Tallahassee, Florida, 32312. Visit us online at nflchurch.com. 
or call us at 850-385-7181. Join us again next time for the Family Bible Hour.